good to see you. Good morning. Uh, we are so honored that SMU would ask us to come and speak. We'll be honest, um, speaking in front of Biola was on our five-year plan or something like that, but sometimes God surprises us, so thank you to SMU. Um, we also want to say we're not experts. We are new in what we're exploring and the way we're living out what it means to be a follower of Jesus. And, uh, and uh, we are just beginning. So we want to invite you along on that journey, and we want to say that there um, are other people that we've pulled our resources from, uh, and we're thankful for them. On that note, maybe we should pray before we begin. Father, thank you that you are a just, good, and loving God. Thank you for your ultimate plan of redemption and restoring everything back to yourself. Jesus, thank you for becoming human and giving us an example of who you created us to be. Spirit, will you hover over this place? We invite you to seep deeper into our hearts and minds. Transform us and our communities to reflect more of heaven on earth. Amen. So we live and attend church in a predominantly low income and Latino community in East LA. And I co-pastor the young adults at our church and Chase helps out with sound and other miscellaneous things. When we were sitting in your seats as students, neither of us thought we would end up in living in LA. I mean, in high school, I thought I'd end up becoming a millionaire. And, and, and I wanted to live in a remote part of the world as a nurse. <laughs> So a little bit about my background. I grew up churched. Um, I was the second oldest of eight kids. I had both of my parents. We grew up in the predominantly white suburbs of the San Francisco Bay Area. I came to Biola in 2005 to study nursing and hoped to live overseas after graduating and do medical missions for at least a few years. Needless to say, God changed my plans a little bit. I became convicted about my own responsibility to my neighbors in my back, backyard of LA. And I realized that I was trying to jump over Samaria in order to get to the ends of the earth. And this realization came mostly uh, through being involved in multi-ethnic programs and development here at Biola. And I joined a community of students that grew up with drastically different experiences than I did. And I realized that diversity is not just a good thing, but it's an essential thing. And we're talking all kinds of diversity. We're talking ethnicity, uh, we're talking age, gender, able-bodiedness, and I realized I need to be in community with people that are completely different than I am. The world, our experiences in the world influence our souls, and that gives us a different way of interacting with God. And so in that regard, we all have different pieces of understanding who God is, and we see a fuller picture of who God is when we're in community with people that are different than us. So as diversity became a value to me, I grew in the desire to displace myself um, into an unfamiliar and uncomfortable context. And so when I graduated in 2010, I moved into Hollenbeck House, which is an intentional community house owned by a Biola professor in Boyle Heights, which is in East LA. And I found a church plant of about 40 people, one neighborhood away, and just started serving there and getting plugged in. So after my year-long stint um, in Hollenbeck House, I moved to the neighborhood to be closer to where my church was. And while most of the people who work in the city commute out into, or commute from the suburbs into the city, I live the reverse. I live in the city and commute into the suburbs to work here at Biola. And along the way, I bumped into this guy who happened to be moving in the same direction. Um, he was moving into Hollenbeck House and um, yeah, just realizing our paths were, were headed in the same direction and we were married this July. <laughs> it's true, uh, while our stories began similarly uh, and wound up really in the same place, God took us on different paths to get there. I, through several moves and school changes, developed the rhythm of displacement early on. One of those moves was a, a trip to Taiwan that lasted a year. Uh, there I learned about myself as a white American Christian man, and I learned what it means uh, to be each of those things by being a minority in another context. Um, there I realized that my American proclivity uh, 
for independence kept me away from that community that, that I saw prescribed in scripture. So I became convinced that if I was to follow Jesus, I personally had to find a way to radically commit myself to community of people not like me. Around the time I signed up for Hollenbeck, um, I noticed Alicia had already lived there, was already living in, in East LA, and she had a lot of good things to say about Jesus and the kingdom. I realized uh, the more I got to know her that she was someone I wanted to be like when I grew up. <laughs> so we got married. <laughs> so our church is different um, from many other churches that I've attended um, over my lifetime. And for one, we baptize people in kiddie pools, we have bilingual worship, we often break into small groups on Sundays, and our once a month potlucks have everything from pizza to pozole. Uh, our church leadership is very open that we are people who do not have it together, and that we are in desperate, desperate need of Jesus. We regularly hear our pastors pay, praying for more patience with their kids, and people are very open about their struggles with substance abuse and sexual addiction. There is no dressing to impress or wearing masks um, to make it seem like we have, all to, have it all together. Our church and our life together is built on Mark 12, 28 through 31, where Jesus lays out what it is uh, and what life's really about. He says, um, then one of the scribes came and asked him, what is the first commandment of all? And Jesus answered, the first commandment is hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. If SMU gave us 15 seconds rather than 15 minutes to talk ab about um, missions, that's what we would tell you. And so during our, our time at Biola, we both felt we received conflicting messages uh, about what missions is and isn't. So today, we're gonna add to the mess. We wanna share what we found missions to be and not be in our life. And I think one of the biggest points is that missions should not be seeking after an experience. Missions is about people and simply living alongside people that are different than us. Missions is an exploration for the divine Imago Dei in others. It's helping them awaken to the image of God inside themselves and knowing along the way you also will be changed. It's a medicine that God prescribes to us to heal our souls uh, from sickness and fracture and to mend us into something better that resembles Jesus. Missions is being the church in a new context. It's living out the good news of Christ's life, death, and resurrection, and calling our neighbors to do the same. It's loving God and loving others in a context that you're not familiar with. Missions is loving God and loving those around us. Your time at Biola may only be four years, but your life is happening now. It doesn't begin when you leave. So be intentional. Wherever you find yourself, whatever plans you have for the future, we wanna offer three ways to love God and love others that can be applied to any context. So number one, missions, if missions is being the church in an unfamiliar context, your community shouldn't look, think, or act all like you do. Practice listening well and learning from other perspectives. In a diverse community, it's essential to operate in a mindset of mutual interdependence. When we come to the table as the body of Christ, no one brings the entire pie. There's a just exchange of resources, be it financial, educational, social, or relational. Everyone has a part to play in the kingdom of God that's equal to their neighbors, and if you can't see that, you've just stopped looking too soon. So seek to diversify your community at Biola. Take that class in your major on diversity that isn't required for, for, your, for your graduation, but take it for your own edification. Attend SCORE conference, it's coming up in February. Um, get involved in multi-ethnic programs and hear stories of Biola students that are different than you. Whether you're white, Asian, black, Latino, we all have a journey to go on in understanding our ethnicity and how that has shaped us. Sign up to have an international student as a conversation partner and then hang out with them beyond your times to get together. 
all of this is strengthening a muscle in our souls called commitment. And that's essential for missional living. Number two, we've got to be committed, big time. As we've shared what we do and where we live with others, some people have told us that moving into the inner city is just a fad, that we're doing it because it's trendy, but transformation doesn't happen overnight. And Chase and I are committed to Los Angeles for the long haul. John Perkins said that the first 10 years of missions is about what God is doing in you. And then the next 10 years is about what God is doing through you. So we're about four months in. I'd say that we've got things figured out by now. <laughs> so if you aren't practicing commitment to community now, it won't come naturally either, later either. In this transitional four years of college life, we won't be the ones to tell you that you need to commit to a church or a life group, but if you aren't having serious sit down, soul bearing, snot crying, um, hug it out sessions with your friends here on campus, you need to begin exercising that muscle of commitment to community here and now. Similarly, it's easy to think that because we have a degree from the Bible Institute of Los Angeles, we have a responsibility to leave here and single-handedly change the world. I know, I've been there. <laughs> if we're not careful, we can find ourselves thinking that God needs us to get his work done. Let's be clear, the harvest is plenty and the laborers are few. God chooses to work on this earth through the church and commands us to make disciples and heal the sick and open the blind's eye. But the burden of conversion does not fall on any one of our shoulders. The founder of the Vineyard Church, is Pastor John Wimber used to say, when it comes to the kingdom, everybody gets to play, relegating missions as a role only to be fulfilled by full-time support-raised missionaries might be what keeps the rest of us from seeing where God wants to work through us here and now. So how do we measure out faith welled up in our hearts? Wimber would say, faith is spelled R-I-S-K. And that's our final word of advice to you. In the effort to live missionally, take risks and put yourself in uncomfortable situations. It was a risk for me to leave nursing, just like it was a risk for each of us to relocate to East LA and leave the American dream behind. These life-altering changes didn't happen out of nowhere though. As a student at Biola, I felt as if you know, God was telling me to put something in the offering plate every Sunday. It didn't matter how little it was, it didn't matter how worried I was about finances, he made it very clear that this was about my heart and not about what would happen to the money that I gave. So this spiritual discipline cultivated in me a greater freedom um, from financial security and, and finding my security in that. So now even when finances are tight, we don't give less and we regularly ask God if there's more that we can be giving. It all begins in the small choices we make every day. In both great, um, there are records of members of the early church giving away the last of their food and going hungry so that other people can eat. We want to take those sort of risks and live a generous lifestyle, but it takes those small first steps, um, beginning to build relationships with people that are in need. Coming from a predominantly middle-class background and not ever really truly knowing want in my life, um, it felt risky to, to step across the line and begin to build relationships that, uh, had less re uh, with people who had less resources than I did. That started when I was a Biola student. Um, I went to the Isaiah House, with the, which is a hospitality house for the homeless in Santa Ana, uh, actually with a, a professor Tom Crisp in the philosophy department. And we began to practice what we called the ministry of listening. We just began by uh, sitting and, and talking with our, our houseless brothers and sisters and hearing about their life. I began thinking that I had something to offer them, great wisdom and insight, um, or the Holy Spirit that I carry with me. But I was surprised time and time again, the Holy Spirit was already there. He met me in those conversations and I learned what it is to suffer. I learned what it is to trust. Big Mama, my friend that I still keep in touch with over Facebook from uh, Isaiah House, um, she told me and, and taught me what it is to trust God when you have nothing, mm -hmm. to pursue God even when the world comes against you. 
her stories go on and we regularly cried together. And I learned very quickly that I had far less to give her than she had to give me. Stepping across those boundaries is risky. Beginning those conversations feels like it costs something from us, and it does. But we believe that you may find life, an abundant life, on the other side. And so we ask that you try that <laughs> while you're a student here. So in both great and small ways, missional living takes risk, especially in being committed to people that are different than you. It's not easy. And you know, just the other, uh, the other day, um, on a Sunday, I was asked to volunteer in the children's ministry. <laughs> Oh man. We won't be having children's kids ministry for like is not another 10 thing. years because of that Sunday. <laughs> oh my gosh, this was the first Sunday. My, our church just moved into a new location. And we were so excited. The sermon was gonna be preached in Spanish for the first time instead of translated into Spanish. And I was so pumped. And I got there early to set up and to greet people. And I was asked to volunteer in children's ministry because they desperately needed some help. And Man, I was disappointed. I, w <laughs> I did not want to be there. Um, but that is, that is church, you know? Like church is not this glamorous uh, time together. It can be wonderful, right? But it's, it's found in those small moments of like, I just, uh, I'm supposed to be serving and having a cheerful heart, you know? And I, I, it was awful. Um, I, I was really struggling with that. And that is the messiness of church and the reality of church and, and doing things and serving in ways that, we, that push us and make us uncomfortable. So commit to people that are, that are different than you. Take that risk. So whether you're planning to go into full-time ministry, if you're planning to move across the world, if you're planning to stay right here in La Mirada, um, you need to be practicing these, these rhythms and learn to develop them in your life now here at Biola. Your life doesn't start in four years, in five years. It starts now. Be intentional with the time that you have now. And it is there, um, it is there, our hope is that you will find the abundant life that we have found. Thank you for your time. Hi guys, I can just see the look of confusion on your faces, like, wait, wasn't this meant to be an in Indian international student? Why is she white? I know, I know, it's crazy. I ask that question every single day when I look in the mirror. No, <laughs> my, let me aid your confusion. My dad is actually, wait, did I just say aid your confusion? No, wrong. Uh, let me clarify. My dad is um, American. My mom is Indian. He is so white that he's literally pink. It's ridiculous. And um, he has generously given me a lot of his genes. Thank you, Father. Um, yeah, but, but I did, I was born in India, grew up there, and uh, I've come to America to study. So it's been, it's been good. Um, so my parents, um, <clears throat> uh, my mom is Indian, yeah, okay. My parents work um, in India, and um, they, they work with children orphans in particular and poor children. And also my father um, specifically works with um, the tribe called the Gones. And, um, and when I was asked to speak about um, what God is doing in India, I was absolutely thrilled because he is doing amazing things. Just, just a lot of wonders are happening. 
Um, India is a country with a booming population of 1.2 billion people. I mean, it's an absolute baby-making machine. And it's expected to beat China in another 15 years, so look out, China. Um, and evidently, Indians place immense value in children. Um, so the future of the church really lies with these with these um, young ones and the people who work with children, they understand this and they understand the value of laying the right foundations because the future of the church lies with the children. And there, because of this, there are a lot of children ministries that are happening and people who work with kids have started to realize that a child's mind is like a sponge and it just soaks up um, everything that they, they are being taught through gospel songs or stories and just videos, you know, they just soak it all up. Um, so my parents work with orphans and um, uh, children who are from poor backgrounds who don't have the opportunity to get good education. And um, it's, it's just amazing how God is working just through the mouth of babes because these kids, they go back um, to their homes for holidays, they go back to their relatives or their parents, and they'll just be, you know, aimlessly wandering and singing the songs that they were taught, you know, all those Christian songs. And it's amazing how simple um, melodies that children have learned, um, simple gospel songs, have just instilled so much hope in the parents' lives. And when the parents bring back the children or the relatives bring back the children, we've seen cases where alcoholic fathers have, um, completely like converted and um, their abusing has stopped simply because a, a child was daring enough to tell them, Daddy, Jesus can help you. Someone taught me this. And um, suicidal mothers who, who were just caught in the grip of destitution because of poverty, you know, they, they've come back because they were, they, were, they were listening to the hope that was in the songs that these, their children would sing to themselves, just playing or aimlessly walking around in the house. And so God has really been doing amazing things. Ooh, the time is like glaring at me. Okay. Um, so parents place very high value in education and... Um, a lot of you come from Asian backgrounds, and we, and we know how much of a value Asian parents place on education. I mean, they can only think of A's. I mean, what, a B, what is this? Slap you, what, what have you gotten? You know, no, only A's. Um, but that's, that's I mean, that's because education is knowledge, and knowledge is power, yes. Um, and it's, and it's really true because education gives opportunity to many of these people to break out of their poverty cycle and, um, and, and it really gives a child the hope to dream. The hope that this, what I'm learning today, this knowledge, I can put into practice and I can make something of myself in the future. And that is honestly the greatest gift you can give to a child, that they can, that they can dream to be someone outside of um, a cycle that has been trapping them for so long. Um, and the Lord is really allowing a, a, such a secular uh, area of development like education to bring people closer to him because now that young people are being educated, they're also starting to question. They're questioning the, the beliefs that they have just blindly believed for so long that their families have followed. They're questioning the religious systems, the religious structures. Um, and through this doubt, God is bring, bringing young people closer to him. Um, as you know, there are a lot of, um, in America itself, there are a lot of Indian immigrants um, who've come and most of them are software engineers or doctors because we're all geniuses. Um, <laughs> but this technological genius has gripped India and in just the last 20 years, India has just developed rapidly. And uh, now because of television, God is just getting his word out there. Just in our state, um, there are 10 Christian channels that air the word of God 24-7 in our native language, just in our state. So, I mean, uh, Indian nationals are just doing amazing things with this. They're taking the word to unreached places just through television. And um, in just five years, such advances have been made that villagers who never even had a phone, let alone a cell phone, are now have like state-of-the-art cell phones. Like I go, I go back home and I don't even have a cell phone. And these like villages will come up to me like, what's your number? Oh, I don't have a cell phone. They're like, what? Yeah, crazy, no. Um, so, and um, friends of our family who work with uh, the Gones, um, they've discovered this amazing thing called a phone chip. And um, 
and they're planning to put the audio of the New Testament in the Gondi language on this chip so that people can just put it in their phones and listen to it while they're doing their work throughout the day. And you know, like farmers will literally be plowing the land and they'll be like listening to music. So it's just cool because um, now we can introduce this phone chip which has the gospel on it. And it just boggles my mind because God is so big, you know, he's the creator of the universe. He holds the universe in the palm of his hand, but yet he has, he has the ability to simplify himself to a phone chip, you know, and um, it's just mind blowing. Um, I mean, because previously big projectors and film reels and, you know, film screens had to be lugged around to introduce villages to the Jesus film, and now the phone chip. So it's, it's great. I think the biggest thing though is um, the nationals who work in India. They are taking the word of the Lord to unreached places where foreign missionaries aren't able to go because of the cultural barriers and the language barriers. And previously, people like my grandparents would have had to like, cross the ocean to you know, bring the good news to people who hadn't heard it. But now, the nationals are taking up the challenge and it's just amazing because just with their simple faith and massive amounts of courage, they've they've taken the good news to so many areas. And despite threats from communist guerrillas or Hindu extremists, or even from their own people, these people know that it's scarier to not know the truth than to die. And um, um, they've been, it's just awesome, yeah. So now I'm just going to finish up with a story because the biggest advantage India has to accepting the gospel is that it's a um, God-conscious country. And, um, even though their belief might be misplaced, most of them are aware that there is a God. Most of them accept that there, um, there is a, a being that is divine and out there. And um, because of this, spiritual warfare in India is also very blatant. Um, yeah, okay. Uh, so, those who were in like century old bondage through witchcraft and idolatry are now being freed through the Holy Spirit and his word. I want to close with the story of um, a particular evangelist by the name of Lal Su. Um, he was working in a Gondi village and um, he noticed that there was there's this old woman who just aimlessly roamed around um, the village and people were scared of her and they said that woman is mad, she's demon possessed and you know she's been like this for some time. So Lal Su decided, you know, let's bring out Jesus and um, he went with a couple of other workers and uh, he, he went to this uh, lady called Mashi and they prayed over her and um, they told her about Jesus. And Mashi was encouraged, you know, she, she was like, thank you so much. But at the same time, she was um, caught in this, um, the despair of depression. So uh, no soon after that, she went back home and she drank a full glass of poison, attempting to kill herself because the oppression was too strong for her. And, um, but in an act of providence, death did not come to her because as soon as Mashi did this, she, she dreamt of two hands lifting her and then placing her down slowly. And as soon as she woke up from that, she realized that it was the work of Jesus Christ. And she immediately put her faith in him and is now an exuberant believer who follows Christ gladly. And um, the context for why she was under this spiritual oppression is because um, the, the Gondis, they practice um, human sacrifice um, to, sorry, they practice human sacrifice to, in order to appease the gods, especially when it comes to harvest seasons, they'll sprinkle human blood on their fields and, and everything. And uh, Mashi's son decided a few years ago that he wasn't gonna do it anymore, that he wasn't going to kill humans to appease the gods any longer. And um, because they were so scared of the wrath of the gods, they quit farming altogether and they didn't even go back to it. Um, and Mashi was the only person in the family who was being oppressed by the spirits because I mean, this all sounds crazy, but it's true, you guys. You don't have to believe me for it to be real. And um, so, uh, um, Mashe, I just lost my train. Oh, God. Okay, um, Mashe, Mashe, Mashe. Sorry, I'm so nervous. Uh, yeah, so Mashe, <laughs> dear God. Yeah, okay. Mashe's son, 
said, you know, I'm so scared to go back to farming, but as soon as Mashi believed, um, they, they believed that they were delivered from the clutches of the evil one. And so Mashi's son called the pastor and his pastors and he said, we want to go back to farming our land. Can you pray over this field? So the evangelists walked through the field and they prayed over it. And um, Mashi's son was like, okay, I'm ready to go. And he just plowed through the field. Because they, they really believe in how um, in, in Jesus and the power that he can, the power that he has over darkness, that it's destroyed forever, that the, they're no longer in that bondage. So I just want to encourage all of you to pray for India, because my time is up, to pray for India, um, because they are brothers and sisters across the ocean. So we are all part of the same church, and God is just doing amazing wonders. I mean, if America is the arm of the church, India could be the leg. You know what I mean? So. It's, uh, it's really imperative for us to see each other as equals because in Christ we are all equal. And we have just as much to learn from our Indian brothers and sisters as much as they have to learn from us. So just keep them all in your prayers. And thank you, SMU, for giving me this opportunity. We hope you enjoyed this message. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Learn more at biola.edu.